It seemed calm on the outside, but trust me, inside I was uh, screaming. So, <laughs> so we're in good shape now. Um, thank you for coming to the talk, Adventures in Open Source Security. Um, my name is Jordan. Uh, I'm a, an R&D engineer at Duo Security, specifically on the Duo Labs team. Uh, and there's my Twitter handle if you like to follow people on Twitter. Uh, now I get it. You know, we, I understand that we're all adults. I, I know my place is the last talk of the day. I know that I'm the person between you and the after party, so I'm kind of the thief of joy today. Um, so that's one role that I play, but another role that I play uh, is that I uh, broken heart emoji open source, um, and these are some of the projects that I've made. So. This talk is about open source. I wanted to, to kind of show you my, my place and my path into open source. Uh, and so I've made a few projects. The, the top left is a, a honeypot for Elasticsearch instances called Elastic Honey. Uh, and the top right is a Twitter bot that monitors pay spin for password dumps. It's called DumpMon. Um, and on the bottom left, we have a, a phishing, a, a open source phishing framework called GoFish that I made a few years ago. Uh, and that'll be kind of the basis for, for a lot of the talk today. And then on the bottom, I have an email library that I need to make uh, for Golang because it turns out to send phishing emails, you have to have an email library. So, so it was kind of doing that first and then leading that into, into GoFish. So this is kind of the, the talk in a nutshell. Uh, my goal was, was to kind of explain, here's what the open source security community looks like. Uh, here's how to get involved, here's why you might want to get involved, uh, and here's some tips that I've learned kind of the hard way uh, along the way with my, my three or four years of, of maintaining uh, a pretty large project, which was, uh, which was GoFish. So we're going to start talking about the current state of open source security tools, uh, and then we're going to talk about how you can get involved yourself uh, in different roles in the community. So let's start by talking about some great open source uh, security tools, some examples that maybe y'all have heard of uh, and the places that it fits into a standard environment. Uh, so the first is kind of around infrastructure management. Uh, there's a few great examples. Facebook's OS query is a, is a really good example. Uh, this is an on-box uh, lightweight agent uh, that makes it really simple to report up telemetry about various parts of the operating system. Kind of their pitch is that you can query your infrastructure like a database, which is extremely powerful. Uh, and then you have Google's Santa, which is an on-box application whitelisting solution for Macs. Uh, so if I'm in corporate security, I can say I want to whitelist these applications uh, and only these applications. Anything else, throw an alert so that we can figure out that there was something that wasn't approved uh, running on this box. And then we have Security Monkey, which is Netflix's solution to how do I secure my AWS environment? Um, there's a lot of pieces, if you've ever played with AWS before, uh, that get involved each with their own vernacular, their own naming, their own XML. It, it ju it's just a rabbit hole uh, that, that goes deeper and deeper. Uh, so Netflix makes this really easy, letting you create policies, set alerts, and, and see kind of in real time changes that are happening across uh, what may be otherwise very unwieldy infrastructure. Uh, and last, I included Algo. It's not quite an infrastructure management. It's more of like a VPN out of the box solution. So let's say, uh, I think we've all been there if you're sitting in this room at some point where you've said, it'd be cool to set up my own personal VPN. Like that'd be kind of nice. And then you start reading into the documentation. You realize that you're running these open SSL incantations to get these certificates and keys. And it, it all just gets wild and you, you don't know which software to use, how to set up uh, all these configuration options just to get a little bit of privacy on the internet. Uh, so that's what Algo tries to solve. It's a set of playbooks and it's a set of configuration options to make kind of a, uh, a best practices VPN very, very easy on something like EC2 or DigitalOcean. So these are examples with big communities behind them and, and we're going to talk about community a lot in this talk because that's one of the things that makes open source security great is that uh, we have all these people contributing to these core sets of problems. Another category is insecurity research, which was kind of the best way that I could phrase uh, man in the middle proxy, uh, which is a generic proxy. Uh, it's extremely popular in the debugging, troubleshooting, security research environment uh, because it makes it easy to stand up a, a man in the middle that can sit between, let's say, a mobile application and the servers that it's calling out to. And it'll show you what requests are being made, what responses are being made. 
and let you modify that traffic uh, in the middle. And then we have intelligence sharing. So, so previously we had talked about um, we talked about tools, you know, things that you would stand up, things that you would run to do something in your environment, but that's not the full story of what we can do in the open source world. I know that maybe not everyone in here is, is a programmer, maybe not everyone in here uh, loves to build tools in, in, in their spare time, but one thing you do have is, is knowledge. You have information about how you configured something in your environment. You have knowledge about uh, maybe some settings that you use that really came in handy for something. Uh, people have these problems and so you can share this out uh, and make everyone's lives much easier. Uh, here are two examples. The first is a, uh, a database of YAR rules. Uh, and real quickly, if you see that format of name slash something else, if you put github.com in front of these, that will take you directly to the project. That's kind of how they're laid out. Um, so YAR rules are uh, an, an open source format for building uh, uh, rules that match on content. So you, IOCs, indicators of compromise, are really big. Whenever it comes to YAR rules, I can say match this hash, match this file name. Um, but whenever you start into a role, the question is, okay, well, what the heck am I supposed to match on? You know, if I can match on anything, what do I look for? Well, this is an, an open source repository of those rules that people curate and maintain as a collection. Uh, and then I think most people are probably familiar or have heard of the, the Twitter personality Swift on security. Um, they maintain a sysmon config, uh, which standardizes alerting and event information for Windows environments. Um, it's extremely useful, and there's a screenshot of the, uh, of the GitHub there. I'm sure you could all immediately read it. Uh, <laughs> and so it's not really, it's not meant to be read. It's more, it's more to show, like, this is what that project may look like. It's, it's a configuration file, but there's context around it. Here's why you might want to use this. Here's um, some ways that you can roll it out. Um, so that's intelligence sharing, and the, there's also security awareness training. I mentioned GoFish before, and I, <laughs> I know what you're all thinking. Jordan, you just put this in there because you made it. Yes, that's exactly why I put it in there. I'm extremely biased. I think, I think it solves a real problem, but I worked really hard on it, so I wanted to include it in the presentation. Uh, but this is just another example of taking a problem that everyone has and making a solution that everyone can use. Um, that's really the whole idea behind this talk and behind open source security is finding those problems and building the solutions. And this is a really great repository. It's called Awesome Hacking. Uh, and, and this is sharing knowledge again. Uh, but this is nothing more than a huge readme that's categorized into different topics of security uh, with sub lists below that. So let's say you're interested in malware investigations. There's a whole list of open source projects for that. Let's say you're interested in uh, uh, PCAP analysis, a whole list of projects for that. So this is, if you're looking for a place to go find a ton of really good tools, I'd start there. So we talked about all this, and again, the, the point is just to emphasize that you don't have to just say, well, I'm, I'm not a programmer, so I can't contribute to open source. That's, that's not true. Everyone in here knows something that's valuable. And it also points towards a bigger trend, which is we're seeing this move away from traditional, I have a box for everything, and more towards an open source SOC. Uh, I think there's, there's a, a, a workshop right now called Open SOC here at B-Sides that's going on that's, that's about how to maintain a SOC using nothing but open source tools. It's incredible that we're at a point now where we can do that, and we can do that effectively, uh, and, and we have communities behind these tools so we're not feeling siloed behind support channels, for example. So, so this is the importance of it. Uh, let's talk about why you should contribute to open source. So it's this big ecosystem. What's, what's in it for you? The first is that you can improve or develop new skills. Now, this doesn't have to just be security uh, knowledge, right? For example, uh, there's a whole bunch of JavaScript frameworks for building websites. You know, maybe you all heard of some of them. There was jQuery was, was one probably everyone's familiar with. There's React and there's Angular. And to be honest, there's probably been five more released since I started this talk. Uh, <laughs> so if you're ever interested in like, hey, I'd be interested in learning how to do something like that, uh, applying it to a security tool is a really great opportunity because it takes those two things that you're interested in, security and, and front end development, uh, and lets you put those two together for the sake of learning something new. In fact, uh, GoFish is, is written in Golang, which 
is the best name I could have ever come up with. Uh, but I didn't know Go before I started building GoFish. I'd heard really cool things about it on Hacker News, and I knew you know all the hipsters were using it. And so I said, well, let's give it a shot. Let's see, let's see how it works. Uh, and it was very much a trial and error over time. If you look at the code added and code deleted uh, for those early stages, it's significant. Uh, but over time, I got better, and I was able to become proficient in Go largely because I was working on this open source project. So these skills can lead into a natural resume that you can have. Now let me caveat this by saying I've heard some kind of damaging trends uh, on, t on Twitter where um, damaging trends happen, uh, <laughs> where people are saying you should always only go for people with a GitHub. That's not true, that's not the case. You know, a GitHub is an addition. If you, if you enjoy contributing to open source, a GitHub can be something that you, it's a portfolio for you. You can show this to hiring managers, you can show this to prospective companies, and you can say, this is something that I'm interested in, here's proof of things that I've done in the past to give you an idea of what kind of work I'm capable of. It is not a replacement for, for you know, all the previous work experience that you have, but it's something public that you can show off uh, if you're looking to, to step up in, in your career. And this is the most important one, which is, joining a community and then giving back to the community. This could be the wider security audience, uh, this could be the security industry at, at large, or it could be a community around a specific tool. Uh, just a couple weeks ago I got back from a, a conference in San Francisco called QueryCon, and it was around OS Query, and it had about 120 <coughs> people there, uh, all there to figure out what are the next steps for this tool. Uh, what does the ecosystem look like, putting some faces to names, and that was incredible because you got to meet, meet some of these people that are working on such an incredible tool uh, and it showed that you, you have a lot of networking opportunities, you can start talking about other problems that you're having. It's amazing how that works. If I have a problem that I use OS Query to solve, chances are if you're using OS Query, we have similar problems, right? And we can talk about those and we can combat those together. And this is kind of a, a bigger point to that idea of community. The software is good, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the software that I make. I'm, I'm proud that it's being used. That's great. Um, but the community is even better. You know, the interactions that I have with people, being able to meet new people, being able to um, uh, share in that experience of, of, of building something together and having it being used by, by any number of different companies is incredibly rewarding because it's a networking opportunity for one. Uh, but it is just a privilege of getting to share that information uh, and working towards a common goal. So if nothing more, just know the community uh, certainly makes it all worth it. And I mentioned this before, but here's one of the best parts about open source. Let's, let's really think about this now. I mean, how many unique security problems do we really think we have in this room? How many of us want to have strong authentication to your applications? Everyone. How many, you don't, you don't have to raise your hand, I know you do. <laughs> How many of us want to control access to, to our data, make sure it's not being exfiltrated by attackers? Everyone. How many people want to know if all of your devices in, in your environment are up to date? Everyone has that. These are fundamental, fundamental problems that everybody in this room shares. It doesn't change across companies. We're not trying to, to beat each other. We're trying to beat the people that are going after all of us. That's kind of the motivation behind pairing together and saying let's tackle this together, not siloed where we all make our own versions of the same thing. We all have our own scripts that do the same thing. Let's build it, let's maintain it, let's improve it, uh, and let's get something really high quality that we can share to a wider audience of people who maybe don't have the same experiences that we do. You know, again, speaking from GoFish, the goal was not to help enterprises that have a large security budget. The goal was to help the mom and pop shops who don't have a budget at all be able to get quality phishing simulations for their own company so that they can stand a chance whenever they're setting up their email infrastructure. We can do that as a security industry and I think there's a lot of opportunity, uh, maybe not responsibility, but, but definitely opportunity to do that. And now let's talk about the anatomy of an open source community. What does it actually look like uh, when you're building one of these out? The structure looks something like this. There's really three roles that you can play uh, in a community. You can be a user of the software uh, where you would create issues, you would create feature requests, you would give feedback. 
You have contributors which are actively committing code, committing I ideas of how something could be implemented. Uh, and then you have maintainers. And maintainers are kind of the architects and the, the stewards of the project. They make decisions, you know, merge in the request, and they control the code itself and the direction for the project. This was taken from a, a website um, from GitHub that I'm going to share a little bit later. Uh, but this is kind of called the contributor funnel, right? And it's the idea of the scale of each of these groups. You're going to have a lot more users than you do contributors, by far. You're going to have a lot of users that you never hear from because the software either did or did not do what they wanted it to do. Uh, and then they moved on or are still just happily using your software. Contributors are a smaller group. Uh, they're going to be a little bit more vocal whenever it comes to support. They're going to be more vocal whenever it comes to committing code. And finally, maintainers are the smallest group, um, generally numbering, let me just take a number out of the air, 10. Um, in, in GoFish, I'd say there's, there's one or two uh, uh, core, core maintainers to the project. So, um, but it goes up. So every maintainer is a contributor. Every contributor is likely going to be a user. Um, and every user is certainly a person. So let's talk about uh, getting involved. So we talked about what a community looks like. How do we get involved in one? Because this can seem really daunting. You know, if you have these big projects that have established communities or very active, it can seem kind of scary getting involved to a community. I've been there. OS Query was my example. I had not used it a whole bunch before I went to QueryCon, but I wanted to figure out how do I jump in. Uh, and this is how you can get involved. The, we're going to take this each role. We're going to start by how to get involved as a user then a contributor, and then a maintainer. So let's start with the user. The first is creating good issues. This is so important. You know, GitHub allows you to make issue templates where it says, here's what information I need to help troubleshoot. But even as a user, taking that initiative and over-communicating can be extremely effective. Uh, at a high level, just what did you do? You know, what did you expect to happen? What actually happened instead? and what additional information you can provide. You'd be surprised. I've gotten issues that say, what did I did? I ran GoFish. What did I expect to happen? It worked. What, didn't, what happened instead? It did not work. Any additional information? I got nothing. <laughs> like that, that, that's really difficult from a maintainer's perspective because there's endless information, endless different routes that that could go. And it causes a whole bunch of round trips of asking for information and asking for new logs to get to the problem. So the more that can be provided up front, the better. And providing help to others. I've seen the same issue come up multiple times. And it's incredible to see users jump in and say, I had that issue. Here's how I fixed it. Or, hey, I, I filed this issue you know, three weeks ago. You can point to it, and we're already kind of working through it. That's the community that I'm talking about, where you don't have to wait for me to get home from work and, and get all of my, my responsibilities taken care of so that I can answer you, you have a whole network of people that are there to help and build with each other. And then you can provide project feedback. So I love receiving feedback, uh, constructive feedback. You know, <laughs> like, like if, it's, if it has a, a goal other than, well, I'll, I'll take GoFish, GoFish sucks. I'll take that too. It's feedback. You know, and it starts a conversation. Uh, but sending in issues if you see something wrong, any feature request, if there's ever a point whenever you're using the software and you think, it'd be cool if, send that in because there's a good chance that the maintainers and contributors either haven't thought of that before or have thought about it before and have addressed it in some way. Even if it's, we've decided that's not the direction we're going, sometimes it's, yeah, that's coming out next release. You know, get hyped. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. Uh, and finally, letting people know about the project. It's really exciting to get to see people tweeting about projects, to see people posting blog posts on, here's how I set this up. That alone is, is, is a, even setting up a blog post of how you set something up could be argued as you're contributing to the project because you're helping people, you're getting people involved, uh, and you're getting the word out. So at, at the very least, just being active and being engaged uh, can be really beneficial to the community. So you've used the repository for a little while. Uh, the, the tool or, or whatever resource it is, it solves a real problem. And you have an idea for something that you want to do. Typically, this is how it works. I have an idea for something that I want to fix. Now I want to be a contributor. I want to con give some code or give some changes or some fixes. How do I do that? 
So if you don't know where to start, GitHub makes it kind of easy. They have a few different issues, uh, labels, that you can use as a maintainer to help identify this is a good issue for someone just joining the project. Maybe it's a documentation fix. Maybe it's um, this log message has a typo in it. Maybe um, moving something from one part of the code to the other. It's not a big architectural feature, but it's something just to get your feet wet and to feel like, okay, I'm starting to get a handle on this. I can explore this a little bit more. And these are a good first issue and help wanted. Um, GitHub will point these out whenever you're looking at a repository. It'll say, here's how many issues need help. You can click on that and it'll filter them automatically so you can start finding things uh, to knock out. But don't be afraid to start small. You don't have to be able to read this. This is actually a, um, uh, a pull request that I did to an update specification, so how to update software, uh, called Tough. And I was reading through the spec and, and I realized a very critical bug, uh, that was that the indentation for the bullets was off a little bit. That's a big deal, right? So I stopped, you know, went into GitHub, you know, forked the project real quick, made my own copy, fixed the indentation, and, and submitted it back up. It took maybe 10 minutes, but that's a contribution because otherwise that maintainer would be either not knowing that that's there or having to fix it themselves, which takes more time away from what they're already working on. So even those small documentation fixes can be huge and incredibly appreciated uh, by the maintainers. And don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, this is, uh, I guess is, is somewhat uh, legible. This is a, a pull request that I got uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, and it was to add sending delays to the way we send emails. Uh, but what I really liked about it was that the person submitting the pull request uh, said, here's what I'm trying to do. Here's my approach. Here's where it's been talked about in the past, uh, but I wanna hear your feedback. I don't know if I'm doing this the right way. I've had people say this is my first time using Golang. I don't know if I'm doing things correctly. Ask for help because I love to give help and maintainers in general love to give help. They, they want your efforts uh, to be recognized and to be used so they'll guide you along. In this case, I was able to say, here's how we can get from A to B. You know, I, I know the code better than they do so I can help guide them through that process so that they can be contributing quicker, uh, which is a really good uh, uh, win for everyone. And now let's talk about getting involved as a maintainer. So you, you've contributed to a project and you've decided I wanna branch out, I wanna publish my own uh, tool or my own resource of some sort. Uh, how do I decide what I wanna open source? These are the three things that we talked about uh, earlier and they're kind of in terms of scale to some extent. It can be as simple as knowledge about a topic. I wanna publish a blog post on how I did X. That's really useful because people are gonna be searching for that whenever they run into the same problem that you did and wanna know how to fix it. And then you have scripts. You know, how many of us have ever written a simple script to get something done at work? I'm also gonna assume all of y'all probably will raise your hands. Uh, but, but most of y'all, yes, uh, have written some sort of a simple script to do something. There's a chance that someone's gonna have that same exact need later. You know, let's say I'm, um, Earlier there was a talk uh, about parsing Google's access logs uh, into a readable format. A lot of people use G Suite, a lot of people use Google's products and they want to parse those access logs. That was a great example of something they decided to open source so that people can use later on. Maybe in the process of using it, someone finds a bug that you didn't know about and they help you fix it. And finally, there's full products. These are the, the, the OS queries. These are the, the GoFish or the Metasploit or any number of these big open source projects that have been around for a while. They start small and they build up over time, but you can certainly commit to, I want to start working on this solution uh, that's gonna have multiple different components uh, along the way. I'd encourage working from left to right, but um, it's 100% it's up to you. And keep in mind, you've likely already built something that you can open source. If you're sitting in this talk and you're wondering, okay, well, I gotta go build something new, that's probably not the case. I would encourage you to find something that solves a problem for you, uh, something that you found useful, something that you're legally allowed to open source, uh, and just, you can put it up on GitHub. It doesn't take a lot of effort. You don't have to worry about filling in all the different unit tests and all this stuff around it. 
put it out so that it's, it's, it's there. That's the hardest part is pushing the, uh, the commit button. Uh, and then it's, it's downhill from there. Downhill. Downhill, <laughs> downhill yes. That, <laughs> you're at least 20% of the way there. Um, so now let's talk about some tips for maintaining pro projects. So this is from my own experience, things that I've, I've battled with, things that I've done wrong and then had to circle back from uh, that may help you when maintaining projects in the future. Uh, the first is to respond quickly and kindly. Um, now I'm not saying that you have to give a paragraph response to everybody, uh, but it helps to respond with something. If someone files an issue or a pull request, you want to at least acknowledge their presence. You know, say, hey, I hear you, I see it, um, I don't have an answer right now, uh, but give me a few weeks and, and I'll get back to you. That alone is perfectly reasonable. Um, the most frustrating thing, I guess, from a user's perspective that I've had is whenever I submit an issue and I just never get a response ever, which is, it's, that's fine, that's allowed, uh, but even if you could say, no is better than nothing, right? You know, if you come back and say, I'm just, I'm not gonna do that because, <laughs> then that's already better than not getting any response at all. But it helps to be kind. Thank them for reaching out. Um, that's always usually how I'll start a response. Thank you for reaching out. Um, I'll put in my, my tagline, thanks again, uh, Jordan, right? And that small, uh, that small note says you're not a burden, you're not a problem, I'm here to help you. Uh, and also don't be afraid to ask for more information. Uh, don't think that you have to solve the problem using what you have. Uh, I, I'm very, very uh, quick to say I need more logs, I need more information from this particular aspect, which can help you troubleshoot a little bit quicker. Because your time is valuable, you know, don't think that you have to spend it trying to do everything yourself. And be transparent. Um, the, what you see on the right is a screenshot from an issue that I opened, because I manage everything through issues, where I wanted to talk about a big change moving forward with GoFish in regard to transparency with how phishing campaigns are run. Okay, long story short. Um, and with this, it was, it was less of to get approval and more of to make it very clear, here's why I'm doing what I'm doing, uh, here's the goals that it solves, uh, and here's what you can expect moving forward. Uh, and so that's, that's the bullets that you see there. What goals do I have? Where can people help? And, and how are these decisions made? The way I laid it out was I had the problem first, I have my goals, and then finally I have my solution. Here's what's going to, huh, Docker. Uh, <laughs> and then my, my solution. Did that really break everything? There we go. Uh, and thank contributors. Uh, contributing to a code base is a very selfless act, right? You know, sure, you get the benefits of it. You probably solve that problem for a reason, but they are taking out of time out of their day to push those back upstream. It's really easy to fix it for yourself and keep it fixed for yourself uh, and let everyone else be struggling with those bugs. Um, so this can come in a whole bunch of different forms. Uh, and this is one of the things I always get excited about is that can be as simple as in the change log, say, uh, like you see here on the bottom, thank you for what you do. I know that there's a lot of contributors out there. It's much appreciated. Um, you can also, in GitHub specifically, you can add them as a contributor to the project with, no, they can't push any code without approval, uh, but it gives them a badge next to their name that just says contributor. It's a super small thing, but it's kind of a source of pride if they're answering issues and they see contributor next to their name. It makes them feel like a very included part of the project. Sorry, just real quick, yeah. guys, I know he's almost done. Uh, if you have any windows open in your cars, it is pouring right now. So just heads up real quick. Sorry. Go ahead. My windows are up, so we're good. <laughs> um, and then lastly, a simple thank you is, uh, is always useful, right? Now, you want to manage your support channels. It's really easy to be ambitious whenever you're open sourcing something. Uh, to give you a flashback, it was 20... 12, 2014, some, somewhere around there. Um, I had just open sourced GoFish and I had, I offered email support, I offered instant message support, uh, GitHub issues, and uh, I think there was some other form of, of ticketing software, some other form of you can get information my way. This is unmanageable <laughs> if, you're a, if you're a single person because people will find the thing that works best for them, they'll try to reach out, all good intentions across the board, but there's just not that much time in the day to be able to respond across all these different channels and to keep up with all these different channels. Because usually this is gonna be side time outside of your normal day job, right? 
And maybe a little bit more simply, what I want to tell you is don't use email as a support channel. Why would, why would that be? Anyone know? Sure. Right, right. And it also, how many people can see that email? Just the person who sent it and you, right? So what you're going to have is you're going to have the same issues coming in over and over with people who they, and they're going to go to email because they, they, they want to reach out to you personally as opposed to broadcasting issues in the, kind of the public domain, right? So I got a lot of emails really, really quickly and found that I can't tell people where to go to look for the solution that I gave. And then a lot of the emails look like this. <laughs> it doesn't work. You know, can, can, you, can you help me out? So if, if you're looking at a way to manage this community and a way to manage these issues, I'd say as, the more public, the better. You know, the more areas where people can jump in and help, the better. And that's why now, just as a personal preference, everything is through GitHub issues. It doesn't matter what it is, it's all there so that I can point people back uh, and get people referenced where they need to go. And don't be afraid to market your project. Uh, so this is the landing page that I made for GoFish. Um, I know it looks really good in like 800 by 600 resolution. Um, but to build this, I used a template builder. I found like a, an online template builder and I plugged in my own text, uh, made a couple screenshots and, and published it out on GitHub pages, which can host static websites for completely free. Um, I'm working on, as a, as a side note, I'm working on a, a blog post soon about how to market an open source project for, for free, uh, essentially, where like how you can set up a uh, full HTTPS domain, uh, a website, really nice looking landing page, email, uh, the whole bit for, for just the cost of the domain name. And, you'll, and so just kind of stepping from A to B, so I guess you can keep an eye out. Uh, but don't be afraid to market your project, tell people about it, go to conferences like this one uh, and, and let people know that it's out there because there's so many projects these days that it's kind of hard to keep up with them. It's kind of hard to keep up with what's coming out. <laughs> and this is something that's uh, <laughs> important to remember and this is something that I kind of have as a personal go-to uh, because at the end of the day, it's free software. It's really easy to get too attached to your code it's really easy to get too attached to what you're doing and wind up burning yourself out. That's, that's the sad reality of it. And I've seen it happen and I've seen people talk about it where sometimes users that come in, maybe they're not so nice. Maybe they, they almost want to blackmail your, your guilt to get something fixed. I've, I've heard people with their own projects have people come in and say, don't you care about your community? Don't you care about your project? This is kind of emotional manipulation, right? Remember, at any given point in time, it's okay to say no to a request. You have that right, you have that responsibility if it doesn't allow you to succeed and allow that project to succeed. On a similar note, it's okay to stop working on a project. And it's okay to never start working on a project. If you have a script that solves a problem, you wanna open source it, but you definitely don't wanna maintain it, you can put it up on GitHub and in the readme say, I will never answer any questions that come in here that at least sets the expectation. That sets the, the understanding between the people using it and you so that they don't think this person is just not responding to me. It's okay to, to, to remember that you're a person, to remember that you have time, you have effort, that you're already volunteering. So take care of yourself. Uh, be kind, but, but make sure that you're watching over the things that you're doing to help you succeed. Um, so I only say that because I'm guilty of, of uh, being too long to, before I say no. So, uh, hypocrite over here. So let's talk about next steps. Uh, so I'm sure all of you right now are just like, oh my God, give me a keyboard, I'm ready to open source something. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you where you can go to find projects to contribute to. Uh, and the first is opensource.guide. Uh, this is less of a how to find projects and more of a very extended CSS version of this talk. Uh, that's not security specific. It's made by GitHub, uh, and it's about managing open source communities in general, uh, which it'll cover a lot of the same topics that, that I talked about today um, in a little bit different light. So I highly recommend it. And then there's github.com slash topics uh, slash security. So in GitHub, you can set a topic or a tag for your project. Um, and, and one of those that's really popular is security. 
And so by going here, you can see what are the most popular security projects that I can contribute to? What are the most active security projects that I can contribute to? And it makes it, it gives you a prioritized list of places that you can jump in, which is about as good as it gets. Uh, so, so I highly recommend if you're looking for projects to go there or to that awesome hacking uh, repo that I talked about just a little bit earlier. And finally, this is kind of the call to action. Let's all look out for one another, right? The security industry is all working together to solve a common set of problems. It's easy to get in this, these blinders where we think, I just need to solve my problems because my problems are special. No one else is dealing with what I'm dealing with, when that's not the case at all. We've seen today, just during this conference, some incredible talks by, by incredible speakers that are open sourcing new tools, that are open sourcing their knowledge. That's a really good place to start. You know, there are people who have just released something and they need help moving it forward. So always be on the lookout for ways to contribute in even small ways. We need more maintainers of projects. We need more contributors to projects. And everyone in here, even if you're not a programmer, even if you've never open sourced something before, you can have a big impact even with, with whatever time that you have. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate y'all coming out and enjoy the after party. Are there any questions? I'll